a Rydberg atom is any simple atom with one electron which is promoted to a very, very high principal quantum number. They were discovered in space around 1965, but in fact they were predicted in Bohr's original paper on hydrogen. He questioned in that paper why it is that one could see hydrogen atoms with principal quantum numbers of 2, 3, 4, up to 17 or 18 had been discovered then but very high lying levels hadn't been discovered in the laboratory. No absorption lines from these levels had ever been seen. And he just made the comment is, well, these atoms are so large and so weakly bound that they would immediately fall apart. That to see these atoms, you need a very large volume where they're very far apart and a great many of them. Well, he did not know about radio astronomy, but that's what radio astronomers had when they look out into space. And in around 1965, these atoms were discovered. Their energy levels are so close that when they radiate, they don't radiate at optical frequencies, but they radiate at microwave frequencies. And beautiful spectral lines were seen. So we know that these atoms exist with principal quantum numbers, say like 100, typically. That was really very interesting and kind of tantalizing for atomic physicists, but there was nothing we could do about them at the time. But then the laser was invented, and then we could make them in the laboratory. And it turns out that they're rather easy to make and very easy to detect. And people have been studying them ever since. We got very interested in the question of how these atoms can be pulled apart. If you apply an electric field to an atom, you can pull out the electron. For a hydrogen atom in its ground state, the field that you need would be billions of volts per centimeter. But uh, when you get to n equals 100, the fields that you need are maybe 10 volts a centimeter. The reason is that there are scaling laws in physics which govern all these simple properties, like the size of the atom. It goes up as the n to the 100, where n is the principal quantum number. I'm sorry, it goes up as, as n squared. But if n is equal to 10, it's 100 times larger than the ground state atom. But you can make atoms with n 100, which are 10,000 times larger than a ground state atom. They're almost macroscopic in size. The um, fields you need to pull them apart go down as uh, about n to the sixth. So with very small fields, you can ionize these atoms. So all their properties are totally bizarre compared to the normal properties of atoms that we're used to. And this means that the atoms can be used for all sorts of interesting things. One, you can use the atom actually to measure electric fields because they're so sensitive to the fields. Normal atoms have very weak, uh, uh, are only weakly affected by electric fields. You can look at collisions between the atoms. In recent years, they've become very interesting because these atoms are so large, they have enormous electric dipole moments, and they can interact with each other. And it turns out there are interesting applications for quantum computation, which have been proposed for these, um, for these atoms using what's the so-called dipole blockade. If you have atoms in a small region, and you excite one to a Rydberg state, then if you try to excite another, the energy that you need will have changed because of the presence of the first atom. So the atoms, you can use one atom to turn off on another atom, and that's been demonstrated. And this kind of behavior is very useful if you're trying to do quantum information processing. So that was another use of these atoms. Maybe the most dramatic use of these atoms was in quant cavity quantum electrodynamics which was the subject of the 2012 Nobel Prize to Serge Hiroch. The prize was for work in an area which is called cavity quantum electrodynamics. And it's the study of atoms radiating in cavities in which the cavity fundamentally changes the nature of radiation. It's totally in the quantum regime that we're interested in here, which is why it's called quantum electrodynamics. If you put the atom into a cavity which is tuned to a transition, and if the atom is in the upper state, it will radiate into the cavity faster than in free space. 
In free space, you have spontaneous emission. In a cavity, the spontaneous emission rate is raised by the presence of the cavity. You can make it radiate much faster. If you make the cavity better and better, you can get the atom to radiate into the cavity before the cavity dissipates the energy. You know, any excited microwave or any resonator which is excited decays, the energy decays. Well, in these experiments, you make the cavity so good that the energy lasts a long time, long enough for the atom to reabsorb the energy. And then it can radiate again. And you have the atom in the cavity oscillating back and forth in what are called atom cavity oscillations. Hiroshi developed this method and applied it to a fantastic experiment. What he did was to take a two-level atom. You start with the atom in the lower level and put it into the cavity. If there is radiation in the cavity, the atom will absorb it by these oscillations. It'll absorb it, and then it'll re-radiate re it back into the atom. So the atom radiates and then absorbs and leaves. Okay. Now, you might think that the atom's state hasn't changed because of that, but in fact it does. It's the nature of a two-level system that if you go up and down, you end up in the same state, but you've introduced a phase shift in the system. So now instead of being in a positive phase, it's a negative phase. Okay. And you can detect that by passing it through a little microwave field whose phase you know. So he developed this method for what's called a non-destructive measurement, where you can actually uh, look, decide whether there is zero photons in the cavity or one photon in the cavity. If there is one photon, you leave it in. You haven't destroyed it. You've measured it non-destructively. So that's interesting by itself. But the really interesting part is that even though the atom leaves the cavity in the same state it entered, and the cavity is left in the same state it was before, the system has changed. And the system has changed because the atom and the cavity have become entangled. They have joint history. They know about each other. To show this, he then passed the second atom through the cavity, which makes the same measurement. Okay. Now, that would not normally be very interesting. But the second atom now is entangled with the cavity. And this means that the second atom has become entangled for the first, with the first, even though they've never really directly interacted with each other. By interacting with this cavity, they become entangled with each other. What does entanglement mean? It means there are correlations between these atoms. They know about each other. And th th these correlations are very, very quantum mechanical, very weird. It's a perfect example of quantum mechanical weirdness. But he demonstrated them. So he's demonstrated this new form of entanglement. Beyond that, you can use the technique to see things in the cavity you would never have dreamt of. He can easily tell whether there's zero, zero photons in the cavity or one. But he can look at larger numbers now, too. He can look up numbers up, up to the order of 10. That may not seem very much. But to be able to count the exact number of photons in a cavity using this technique is something which was never before feasible. And he can see in the cavity how these atoms, how the photons escape one by one. What you think of as ring down of the cavity is now countdown of the photons. And all of this is measurable. These were made possible by Rydberg atoms. So the field contains much more physics than anyone dreamt of when they were first discovered. The real question now is how one can actually employ these new techniques. It's, it's a new world of quantum phenomena, this world of entanglement. This is at the heart of quantum information theory and, propos and for proposals for quantum computing. I think that there's a broad feel, uh, feeling now that this new world is just opening up, the world where we can do things on the quantum level with macroscopic systems. Uh, the, the atom vacuum oscillations can be seen now with the electrical circuits and with mechanical systems too. So we have the potential right now for building with our hands mechanical, um, mechanical 
deeply quantum systems. That's something very new and very exciting. The problems that need to be solved are basically technical problems. Doing these problems in the microwave took Hiroshi and his group years and years to develop the microwave cavities, which were good enough for that. That's why people are trying other methods right now, and they're just they're just moving forwards with them. One can now make a little mechanical harmonic oscillator, a particle on a spring, and you can get it down into the ground quantum state. That's something which was just unheard of before, and it's only now that one has done that that one sees the vision for starting to do things with these. So th this is a new world of quantum phenomena um, in which we no longer need to rely on nature to make the atoms for us, but we can make our own quantum systems.